And like Russ, I want to start with the usual disclaimer that my views do not are my own and do not necessarily represent the views of the STB or its members. I got into this whole railroading thing by writing a dissertation on an economic and financial history of the Union Pacific Railroad, which I spent a fair amount of time at Virginia in the library doing a lot of research with those dusty old volumes. And periodically, I like getting back into dusty old volumes, which actually is kind of how I got into this. I spent seven years in the railroad industry after around the railroad industry after graduate school working at a consulting firm and then at the Association of American Railroads. And at the time I left the Association of American Railroads, I thought, gee whiz, one of the benefits is I may never have to do with Burks again. <laughs> well, fast forward to 2001, and I come back to the, S I come to the STB, and a couple years after that, I be become responsible for Burks. And this started me on a, on a journey to find out what is Erx? Where did it come from? Why is it the way it is? And it really gets back to a key question, which is how to regulate an industry. The railroads, after all, were really the first industry that got regulated. Regulation was and is a complex task fraught with political perils. What it, but what was the economic basis for it? Set railroads based on what? Cost? Maybe we should just start out being fair. And in my dissertation, I wrote a chapter on a famous case, Smythe versus Ames. There are many regulatory case in the eight, cases in the 19th century cu culminating with one called Smythe versus Ames, which involved the Union Pacific against the state of Nebraska. That case is a so-called fair value case, which said a regulated rate should be based on the fair value of the investment has some, uh, makes some sense, except the problem is it's circular, as Hope Natural Gas later on pointed out. Another, another milepost on this regulatory journey is the Transportation Act of 1920. That's the act that told the ICC, the Interstate Commerce Commission, to inventory the fair value of all railroad assets. That turned out to be a gargantuan task and was never completed, although there's still files about the old ICC inventory. The next milepost I want to point to is the Emergency Rail Act of 1933, which actually removed the fair value standard from, from ICC regulation and had put in place instead the directive to balance the carrier's need for adequate revenues with the public's need for lowest cost service. That's an interesting balance, because that balance got all the way into the Staggers Act and exists in the law today. The balance between the carrier's need for adequate revenues and the, the public's need for re reasonable rates. The ICC then, and this is the fourth milepost, decided it needed to figure out a cost of service. So it created the Rail Form A costing system. But the Supreme Court was also involved in regulation. In fact, there's an important case in 1915 between the Northern Pacific Railway and North Dakota. That case said a regulatory agency must include adequate provision for fixed and constant costs and could not set rates that were only slightly remunerative. This certainly meant no rates that were simply set on incremental cost. With this decision, the Supreme Court put rail regulatory agencies on the path to include more than simply marginal cost in their regulatory costing systems. As we all know, railroads not only have fixed costs, they have common costs. And if a regulatory agency is to include more than marginal costs in its costing, it has to find a way to, to allocate those common costs. And that is what Rail Form A aimed to do. The ICC, in fact, created Rail Form A to be a system average costing system. And it used the agency's uniform system of accounts. It's an accounting costing system. When the ICC was pretty much finished with Rail Form A in 1940, it reported to the Senate that it believed that 70 to 80 percent of railroad cost varied with volume, that the rest is fixed cost and needed to be assigned. 
The ICC also declared at the time as part of Rail Form A that 100% of equipment and 50% of road property investment were variable. With this treatment of equipment and road property investment, the IC was permitting some capital recovery, but not all. It also made Rail Form A a hybrid. Rail Form A is really an intermediate costing system. So let's fast forward for through the 40s and 50s and 60s and come to the 1970s. This is a tragic time for the railroad industry. The railroads at that, during that decade were making less than 3% return on investment. And there were many, many bankruptcies. I think Bob Gallimore has mentioned it. It's certainly in his great book. The Penn Central was probably the most not notable bankruptcy. It had at the time 1.5 billion in revenues, 7 billion in assets, and 100,000 employees. Gallimore had a list of reasons from trucks to weather for why Penn Central was in such dire straits, but many blamed heavy-handed regulation. Other big names going bankrupt at the time included the Rock Island, the Milwaukee Road, Boston and Maine, the Erie Lackawanna, the Reading, Central of New Jersey. More than one-fifth of railroad mileage was in bankruptcy. So there was a real need to revise regulation. How could we revise regulation? What could we do? We needed to see at the time if the railroads could generate enough cash, enough revenue to sustain themselves. The goal at the time was to see if the railroads could become revenue adequate and not become wards of the government. And in a series of three legislative acts, Congress basically did a partial deregulation of the industry. One important feature of this was to encourage contracts. And contract, any private sector solutions that involve contracts were pulled away from, S, at, I, at the time, ICC jurisdiction, now STB jurisdiction. Juris, ICC and STB had no juris, have no jurisdiction over contracts. The ICC also moved to exempt a lot of traffic that it thought was subject to robust intermodal competition. So there are a lot of exemptions granted. And as we've discussed a little bit, as Russ was talking about, there are lots of, of mergers that were taking a long time. And so merger deadlines were put in place. Notoriously, the, the one poster child was the U Union Pacific Rock Island merger, which after 10 years, the Union Pacific pulled out of. But let me focus here on an, another important pillar, which I think is the revenue to variable co ju cost jurisdictional threshold, which today removes about two thirds of railroad traffic from STB jurisdiction. You know, anything below 180, the STB has no jurisdiction over. The key here to think about this R RVC threshold is that it was designed to be a threshold, I'm mean, designed to be a safe harbor for, for pricing. To stay in the private sectors, again, revenues must exceed cost, or the government would end up subsidizing the railroads or taking them over. The search for assuring adequate revenues moved to a regulatory cost concept. This was during the debates over coming up with the new system that ultimately was part of Staggers. This new regulatory cost concept was the cost recovery percentage, or CRP. The House Committee on Interstate and Foreign Commerce created the CRP as a test to determine, and I quote, the level at which a rate exceeds the level necessary to cover costs, unquote. Another way to look at the safe harbor CRP was that it was sought to determine just how far the railroads could exploit their market power before shippers could seek regulatory relief. CRP was then to be a political settlement. settlement. ICC staff researched what the appropriate CR CRP should be. So one question that occasionally comes up is exactly where did the 180 come from? The ICC staff reported to Congress that the optimum, CR, optimum CRP safe harbor should be between 190 and 200 percent. Not everyone agreed with this assessment. The National Industrial Traffic League, NIT League, 
opposed setting CRP at 190 because it gave railroads a windfall above what NIT League observed was full cost recovery, which was only 140%. That would be the percentage markup railroads needed to achieve to cover all their expenses. NIT League said that such a high CRP, railroads would have no efficiency incentive. Instead, they would just pass on cost increases through to shippers. In fact, Interstate Commerce Commissioner Charles Clapp also disagreed with this CRP at 190 or 200. He supported a lower percentage in testimony before Congress. He said it should start maybe at 160. When the Staggers Act was enacted, it compromised. Congress compromised. The law originally set the IS ICC's jurisdictional threshold at 165 and increased it each year by 5 percent percentage points until it reached 180. That is where the jurisdictional threshold has remained for the last three decades. Another part of Staggers was to provide a new regulatory costing system. This is what became IRCS. And it would be based on a new accounting system. This IRCS would set the variable cost, the denominator, in the RVC ratio, so important to the concept of a safe harbor for pricing. To provide guidance to the development of the USOA and IRCS, Congress instituted the Railroad Accounting Principles Board, the RAPB. The Staggers Act created the RAPB, and Congress funded the RAPB in 1984. It gave, Congress gave the RAPB two overriding goals. First, to establish a body of cost accounting principles to serve as a framework for implementing the regulatory provisions in which cost determination plays a vital role, and two, to make administrative and legislative recommendations necessary to integrate the principles into the regulatory process. The Staggers Act directed the ICC to implement and enforce the RAPB's cost principles through rulemaking, and such a rulemaking process would afford interested parties an opportunity to participate. Staggers recognized the ICC was ultimately responsible for the cost principles embedded in its costing system, but the ICC needed to explain the rationale behind the rules. RAPB got a lot of econometric critique and a lot of econometric suggestions. Econometric models were proposed to replace rail form A, but the RPB did not support such models, nor the econometric critique of, of the existing regulatory costing approach. The RAPB dismissed the econometric critique of regulatory costing for three reasons. First, econometric models had limited suitability for movement costing. That was necessary if you're going to set a jurisdictional thre threshold for one particular movement. Second, econometric models were not practical. They required too much information. And this was at a time when deregulation was trying to reduce the burden on the railroads, so it made more sense to try to reduce the amount of information the ICC collected. Third, econometric models were complex and were not easily understood by the community. The RAPB completed its mission with the publication of its principles. These principles remain the foundation of regulatory costing and IRCS. The ICC designed IRCS as an accounting cost system, not an economic cost system, and certainly not a marginal cost estimating system. Using system average costs based on the uniform system of accounts was about all that was possible in a deregulatory context. Again, because the goal was to reduce the amount of information that the agency gathered from the railroads. I, IRCS diver, diverges from marginal costs in both that IRCS creates system average estimates and it is not short run because IRCS incorporates rail form A's treatment of road property investment as 50% and equipment at 100% variable, IRCS is better described as an intermediate run system like Rail Form A was. As such, IRCS allows some capital recovery, but not all. IRCS fundamentally re represents a political settlement 
One critical function for ERCs was to set the regulatory threshold. This function came from staggers. Congress set the threshold to allow the railroads a safe harbor for pricing, and the threshold incorporates an implicit return on investment. Furthermore, setting the 100% threshold is in the law and cannot be changed by the board through rulemaking. ERCs is a regulatory tool, results from the political process that brought rail deregulation. As such, ERCs has played an important role in the way partial deregulation of the industry has evolved over the last 25 years. Question? Bill, if, if you can say what, what um, I, I, I think I have heard that the board or the board staff have been considering revisions to ERCs. Is that accurate? And can you say how those, how those might, what those might be based on or how they might, uh, how they might go? We do have an ongoing proceeding. We have an ongoing proceeding. Well, I would just say that it exists. It's to look at how the ERCs accounts for efficiencies in the shipment of multi-car unit train type shipments. And we're in the midst of doing that. That's probably about all I can say about it for now. Okay. Any other? Yep. Considering that um, the cost of information collecting has reduced dramatically since the 1980s and the available computing power to kind of create these econometric models, is there any future thought towards maybe moving back towards those or would that have to be done by Congress? I think you'd have to have Congress change the 180 because inside the 180 is embedded this notion of what you know, Rail Form A put in place and what ERCS has put in place. So to, to go back and to try to do econometric models doing marginal cost, you'd have to come up with a new threshold, and only Congress could do that. And any more, more questions? Yep. Bill, thanks so much. Great history. I want to add two quick points to the history, uh, and thanks for going back to Smythe v. Ames. Um, in 1911, I believe it was, the Hadley Commission had to come out with a proposal for what to do about this fair rate of return standard. And what they came up with, a fair rate, a reasonable rate, is one that allows the railroad to earn capital and to reinvest, okay? So that kind of right there says it all, doesn't it? It says the fair rate of return is really a test of what capital can I raise and what capital uh, do I need to raise to reinvest in the railroad. Then there was one other enactment, and that was the 1913 Valuation Act. Um, and that one came to a long, long end much later, as you suggest the 1920 Act did. Very important. And along the way, what the economists were saying was, we can't just look at the cost of, of service, we have to look at the demand for service. And so we had the whole thing of, about demand-based rates came about. And uh, on that, there was much more agreement that we have to use demand-based rates in order to sort out what the market will allow to move. Right? Do you agree with that? I do agree with that. Good. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs>